فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل واشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه والتابعين لهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد الله سبحانه وتعالى my beloved brothers and sisters he bestows upon us many blessings and if we as his creation sit down today and we try to we try to count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we will never ever be able to put a figure on it and that's why Allah said in the Quran wa in ta'uddu ni'mata Allah la tuhsuha inna al-insana ladhlumun kafar if you try to count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you will never ever be able to put a figure to it because it's so much in number and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> they come in two types blessings which are fundamental blessings ni'ams which are usul fundamentals and there are blessings which are furu' whichever of those blessings we speak about there's never a uh, the ability in a person to ever know how much they are whether it's the usul of the ni'am the fundamental blessings of Allah you will never ever be able to say this is how much it is and if you look at the 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 blessings which are furu' that are sub branches you will also not be able to what you will also not be able to uh, put a figure to it and now that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala has given us these blessings there is something that we need to come in return with it and that is why the scholars they say الشكر gratitude is قيد للموجود and صيد للمفقود the scholars they say that patience sorry the gratitude gratitude it holds down for you it holds down for you the blessings you already have if you come with shukr gratitude the blessings which you already have will stay with you and they won't go and you will also receive the blessings which you don't have that are missing from you allah will give it to you because of the gratitude that you came with so this is the blessing of gratitude it brings you what you don't have and it also holds down for you and keeps for you what you already have and from the blessings that i'm going to be speaking about today is al-awlad children children are a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my beloved brothers and sisters have you never not seen have you never seen a person who's wanting to have children and they've been trying to have children for a very long time have you ever seen their face whenever whenever the issue of children come up how sad and emotional they become because they know they are missing a great blessing this is a blessing my beloved brothers and sisters who even the prophets realized and they wanted allah to give them children look at nabiullah zakaria for instance in surah al anbiya allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says wa zakaria id nada rabbahu and when zakaria called unto his lord rabbi la tadarni fardan wa anta khayru warithin zakaria said to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do not make me a person who is alone don't leave me as a barren person who is alone in this world wa anta khayrul warithin and allah oh you love inheriting so zakaria alayhi salam a prophet of allah he humbled himself to allah and he begged him for children so this is something even a prophet of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala realized So it's a blessing my beloved brothers and sisters to have children. But as I said whenever a blessing comes a gratitude is needed. And the gratitude it comes in many forms and we all know the difference between gratitude 
which is hamd and shukur. Shukur means that you come with gratitude verbally, you come with gratitude from your heart, you feel that Allah has bestowed a blessing on you, and last but not least, you physically, physically, you show that you are in a state of gratitude for what Allah has bestowed upon you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So children are from those blessings you need to show gratitude regarding. And Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and his messenger, if you look at the religion, they've given a lot of importance regarding children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu quu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara wa quudu an nas wal hijara alayha malaikatun ghilaadun shidaadun la ya'asoon Allah ma amarahum wa yaf'aloon ma yu'maroon. Allah tells us in this verse, he says, all those of you who believe, Protect yourselves from the hellfire and your families. So Allah Taala commands us in this verse after referring to us as his believers. Saying, oh, those of you who believe. So the minute you hear the verses like, Ya ladina amanu, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, what did he say? Far'iha sam'aka. Bring your ears close. Because you're going to be commanded something or you're going to be prohibited from something. So here we're going to find a command or a prohibition, one of the two. So what is it, what is it going to be? A command. Protect yourselves, number one, from the hellfire. And also protect your children from the hellfire. What have the scholars of tafsir said regarding protecting your children from the hellfire? How do I protect my children from the hellfire? What does it mean to protect your children from the hellfire? It means... As the Mufassiruna say, the scholars of Tafsir, those who've commented on this verse, they said, It means by teaching them, by teaching them the religion of Allah wa ta'ala and his legislation. And that you manner them and you cultivate them upon that. So it means that you educate your children about the religious affairs, the religion of Allah. You educate them. Ilm, knowledge. You also manner them, teach them manners and how they should come with manners. And also you cultivate them, tarbiyah, upon that. So this ayah is the first evidence to show the ahmiyyah, the importance of tarbiyah to awlad Cultivating your children correctly. Bukhari and Muslim, both of them collected in their authentic book on the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar. Radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma, may Allah be pleased with him and his father. He said, I heard the Prophet of Allah saying, Abdullah ibn Umar is saying, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun ar ra'iyati. Every one of you is a shepherd for a herd of sheep. And every one of you is responsible for his herds of sheep. And the Prophet went on to say, A man is a shepherd over his own family. وَهُوَ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَتِي And he will be questioned that responsibility the Day of Judgment. So a man is responsible for his wife and his kids. And the Day of Judgment, he will be questioned regarding that responsibility. Allah is going to ask him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, about this responsibility. Also, Imam Muslim and Bukhari on the authority of Ma'qal ibn Yasar, رضي الله تعالى, عَنْهُ May Allah be pleased with Ma'aqal ibn Yasar, a noble companion. He said, I heard the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم say, and this is the wording of Imam Muslim, مَا مِنْ عَبْدٍ يَسْتَرْعِيهِ اللَّهُ الرَّعِيَةِ يَمُوتُ يَوْمَ يَمُوتُ وَهُوَ غَاشٌ لِلْرَعِيَةِ إِلَّا حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ The Messenger said, 
There is not a person who Allah has placed responsibilities on his shoulders. There is not a person who has been burdened with a responsibility. And he comes the day of judgment. He comes the day of judgment without fulfilling his responsibilities. Except Jannah has been made haram from him. Anyone who comes and he has not fulfilled his responsibilities. And he comes the day of judgment. He will be questioned about that responsibility the day of judgment. And not only will he be questioned, he will also be prohibited from entering Jannah. So this hadith is very serious and it's very scary and worrying. So from the things that are part of the responsibility are your children. They are your responsibilities. And you're going to be questioned, Imam Allah Ta'ala, the day of judgment. The hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, مُرُّ أَبْنَاءَكُمْ بِالصَّلَاةِ لِسَبْعِ سِنِينَ This also is another hadith that shows us how Islam has given importance to children. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, command your children to pray the prayer, to pray to Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala and to pray the Salah li sab'i sinina when they are at seven, of, seven years of age. When the child is seven, command him to pray the Salah. وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا لِعَشْرِ سِنِينَ And when they reach the age of ten, manna them, educate them. Huh? And manna them upon what? وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا لِعَشْرِ سِنِينَ at the age of ten. So now, first of all, it was just command them. But then when 10 comes in, it becomes forcefully. The parent now takes it to a another level. وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا لِعَشْرِ سِنِينَ 10 years of age. وَفَرِّقُوا بَيْنَهُمْ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ And also divide the children. The boys and the girls in their sleeping. So the boy should not sleep with his sister. And the sister should not sleep with her brother. So there has to be division between them. So the boys have their room and the girls have their room. And from that age, the child is already being taught there, this is girl's room and this is the boy's room and he grows up knowing that. I ask you this question from the bottom of my heart. If the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, وَفَرِّقُوا بَيْنَهُمْ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ Divide them in their sleeping, the brother and the sister. If the Prophet of Allah is commanding you to divide a brother from his sister when it comes to their sleeping, where does it come into the equation to allow him to free mix with his cousins or to sleep with his cousins? And this is a common practice amongst, uh, amongst us. That the boy is not taught the difference between men and male and female. That there should be no free mixing taking place in your household. That the brother and the sister are at a very young age already learning everybody's room. The boys don't go into the girls' room and the girls do not come into the boys' room. And so this small tarbiyah is what the sharia is placing. So this religion, my beloved brothers and sisters, is a religion that places every single thing in its place. It speaks about everything. It deals with everything. It's a solution for our problems. And wallahi, because of this point, because of this point alone, the lack of importance being given to this, it was found brothers and sisters doing something wrong with one another. Cases that I've personally been told. Brothers and sisters doing wrong things with one another. And also cousins doing something wrong with one another because the div dividing of the beds were not taken serious. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Addib ibnaka, mana your child. Fa'innaka mas'oolun anhu, you are responsible regarding that child. Mana your child, educate your child. For verily, you are responsible over him. What are you going to be questioned the day of judgment? Mada addabtahu, Abdullah ibn Umar said. You will be questioned the day of judgment. What manners and what etiquettes have you taught your child? وَمَاذَا عَلَّمْتَهُ and what have you taught your child? وَهُوَ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ بِرِّكَ وَطَوَاعِيَتِهِ لَكَ And he's also responsible in being obedient towards you 
and he's also going to be questioned as well and he's responsible of obeying you in what you tell him to do. But which one comes first? The thing that, come, the thing that comes first is you as a parent have to cultivate your child correctly. You have to raise your child correctly. You have to educate your child correctly. You have to take the responsibility of your child very serious. And then once he's grown up, he's responsible of listening to you, obeying you, being obedient towards you. That's what Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said. Sufyan ibn Sa'id al-Thawri rahimahullah. He said, Yambaghi lil It is necessary for an individual. أن يكره ولده على طلب الحديث فإنه مسؤول عنه. It is necessary that a individual, a parent, the mom or the woman, doesn't matter, that they burden the child on learning the hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم فإنه مسؤول عنه because you are responsible of your child. And the statement of uh, Sufyan ibn Sa'id al-Thawri here, talab al-hadith, is a it means not knowledge. It doesn't just mean hadith. It means it's science and it's commentary and everything. And we'll speak about that, inshallah ta'ala, in more details further into the lecture. So here what we learn is from the things that when Allah was saying in the ayah, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amalu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara, what it meant. All of this is an explanation. The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مروا أبناءكم بالصلاة لسبع سنين وضربوهم عليها لعشر سنين وفرقوا بينهم في المضاجع. That it means how to do. قو أنفسكم أهليكم. How do you protect the children? And also the statement of عبد الله بن عمر رضي الله تعالى عنه where he said أدب ابنك فإنك مسؤول عنه ماذا أدبته وماذا علمته وهو مسؤول عن برك وطواعيته لك. And the statement of Sufyan ibn Sa'id al-Thawri. ينبغي للرجل أن يكره ولده على طلب الحديث فإنه مسؤول عنه. All of that is an explanation regarding the آية يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم وأهليكم نارا. الإمام سلطان العلماء العز العز بن عبد السلام هي زبوك قواعد الأحكام في إصلاح الأنام. And this book of his by العز بن عبد السلام رحمه الله تعالى is a book where he tries to prove the masalih and the mafasid, how it enters every part of the, the religion. Um, so he's trying to prove that the masalih and the mafasid are from the qawaid al-kubra. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And he talks about many things in that book of his. It's a book that one should sit down and read and, and truly will benefit from. But there's something he mentioned in his book that stood out for me. And that is, and that is, when he was talking about the rights that the community have on you, and this is a point that many people forget. That the tarbiyatul awlad, the cultivation of the children, is an issue, it's an issue that the rights of the children are not just between you and the children. No, 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 no. It's a right that the community have on you as well. I have rights on you in regards to you cultivating your children correctly. It's one of the rights I have on you because your child is going to live with us. He's going to be part of the community. It's either me or my children or my cousins or my family members he's going to rob if you don't cultivate him correctly. And if you cultivate him correctly, the people who are going to reap the benefits from him, pray behind him in the salah, listen to his lectures, are going to be us, the community members. So it's a right that we have on you. And this is what he mentions. He says, وَمِنْهَا حَضَانَةُ الْأَطْفَالِ from the rights that the community have on you is حَضَانَةُ الْأَطْفَالِ وَتَرْبِيَتِهِمْ وَتَأْدِيبُهُمْ وَتَعْلِيمُهُمْ حُسْنَ الْكَلَابِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَالصِّيَابِ وَالسَّعِي فِي مَصَالِحِهِمُ الْعَالِيَةِ From the rights that the community have on you is what? That you cultivate your children correctly and you educate them and you manner them in what? حُسْنُ الْكَلَامِ to speak good You teach your child how to speak correctly that when he asks people for things, you always remind him to say, please. At a very young age, you're teaching him these manners. Wasalati was siyam. And you teach your child how to pray, and you teach him how to fast. Wasa'ifi masalihumul aliya. And that you also strive to the great benefits that the child needs. 
whether it be his worldly knowledge as well, his health, his food, all of that you take care of. And wallahi, my beloved brothers and sisters, it's sad because these scholars, when they're talking about cultivating children and educating them and teaching them, remember their society automatically helped them. They were in an environment where the father would teach the child etiquettes and manners, and then when he went onto the streets, the people, the community would also start, start to push that principles and start those teachings that you already taught your child at home, the community will help you as well. So your child is consistently learning good from the streets as he's learning it in the house. But we're not in that kind of society anymore. We're in a society today where if the child doesn't get good cultivation at home, he's most likely not going to get it on the streets. So it's very sad of us as parents to take that child and bring him in a society like this. Throw him in the society and not give him any preparation and then still tell him to protect, protect himself and to be careful and to not get caught up with the problems of the streets and to not misbehave. We're throwing him into the society like this and we have not taught him anything and not benefited him. Benefited him and we're not only not done that for him but rather we're trying to tell him and expect from him to not get caught up in in the bad uh, company and the streets and what's taking place. And this reminds me of the line of poetry that the scholar said, أَلْقَيْتَهُ فِي الْيَمِّ مَكْتُوفًا وَقُلْتَ لَهُ إِيَّاكَ إِيَّاكَ أَنْ تَبْتَلَّ بِالْمَاءِ This reminds me of a person, the poet said, you tie the person from the back, you tie them from their arms like this, and once you tie them across their arms, you took them from the collar from the back, you threw them into the water and you said to that person, hey, be careful, do not let the water touch you. Be careful, don't let the water touch you. And that's exactly what many people do in terms of the cultivation of children. They brought their children into a society like this, into a country like this, into an environment like this. They've not educated their children, they've not benefited their children, and then they expect from their children to behave to not be criminals, to not be a problem and a havoc in society. Two opposites don't come. What you're doing is actually work towards him becoming this evil individual who he has become. The pious predecessors, they saw this. And that is why Umar and Amr ibn al-As, the great noble scholar, Sahabi, and a scholar, Amr ibn al-As, he one day saw a gathering where people were sitting. Amr ibn As, he saw a gathering and it was adults that were sitting there. And what they did was they got rid of the children and the young, the young kids. They told them to leave the gathering. And so it just became a gathering of elders. So Amr ibn As, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said to the elders that were there, he said to them, مَا لِأَرَاكُمْ قَدْ نَحَيْتُمْ هَاؤُلَاءِ الْفِتْيَانِ عَنْ مَجَالِسِكُمْ He says, why is it that I have seen you disperse getting rid of the young children from your gatherings. Why have you got rid of them from the gathering? لا تفعلوا. Don't do that. Don't get rid of them. أوسعوا لهم وأدنوهم. Rather give, make space for them and bring them close. وحدثوهم. Speak with them. Converse with them. وأفهموهم الحديث. And if you think they don't understand what you're talking about, try to explain it to them as well. فَإِنَّهُمُ الْيَوْمَ صِغَارَ قَوْمٍ For verily today, they are young kids, maybe, for a people. They are young for a generation, yes. وَيُوشَكُونَ أَنْ يَكُونُوا كِبَارَ قَوْمٍ But very soon, they are going to be elders for another generation to come. وَإِنَّا قَدْ كُنَّا صِغَارَ قَوْمٍ We were once young for a generation of people. ثُمَّ أَصْبَحْنَا الْيَوْمَ كِبَارَ قَوْمٍ And here we are today, we are elders for a generation. So, taking your children to the beneficial places you go to, whether it be the Salah and the Masjid, whether it be Hilaq, circles of knowledge. Now, a lot of parents, parents don't take their children with them because they know why they can't take their children with them. Because they speak filthy language. Or they sit in a kaf where they are not adhering to the Islamic principles and the Islamic manners. So they know if they take their children to those gatherings which they go to, their child is going to 
the child is not going to take good from it. So you as a parent, why are you in that gathering in the first place? And this also brings me to another point which is, a lot of parents, they, they themselves do not go to that circle of, seek, that circle of knowledge. There's a halaq, a halaq, where there's a gathering that's taking, knowledge is being taught, a book of hadith is being taught, or tafsir is being done. The parent will grab the child by the hand, and he will drag the child to the masjid, and he will tell this, the child to sit in the masjid and listen to the, to the benefits that are being given here. And automatically the parent will walk away. Where has he gone? He goes to a calf, chit chats, and picks the child up from there. If only the child saw from you, sitting with him in that gathering, and benefiting with him, wallahi, that would be more beneficial for him than the whole lecture probably. Because what he, you're preaching to him, and what you're telling him to do, is something he does, he does not see you do it. So this is the same as the statement of Amr ibn al-As. Um, <clears throat> what are the things that a person needs to cultivate his child on when the child is very young? This brings me to the next point. The first point was what? Ahmiyatu tarbiyat al the importance of cultivating your children correctly. We've taken that point, we're now going to move on to the second point. The second point is, at tarbiyat al the cultivation of the children, of the children what angles can one do it from? I mean, where do I need to focus on cultivating my children? The first thing that a person needs to cultivate his child upon is al aqidah al-Sahiha, a correct aqidah. That the child is cultivated and is nurtured upon the correct methodology, a correct aqidah, correct belief. And that is why the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as Imam al-Tirmidhi narrated in his sunan, من حديث عبد الله بن عباس that the prophet said to Abdullah ibn Abbas إني أعلمك كلمات what did he say to at the beginning يا غلام oh boy young boy I'm going to teach you words إني أعلمك كلمات احفظ الله يحفظك احفظ الله تجيت تجاهك إذا سألت فاسأل الله وإذا استعنت فاستعن بالله so the prophet told him oh boy I'm going to teach you some words and what was it that he taught him? Tawheed al-Aqeedah. إِذَا سَأَلْتَ If you ask, only ask Allah. Don't associate partners with him. فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ If you're looking for aid and support, only look for it in Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. And he taught him, وَعَلَمْ نَوْ أَنَّ الْأُمَّةِ The whole ummah come together. اِجْتَبَعُوا عَلَىٰ أَيَّ فَعُوكَ بِشَيْءٍ لَمْ يَنْفَعُوكَ إِلَّا بِشَيْءٍ قَدْ كَتَبَهُ اللَّهُ لَكَ وَإِنْ اِجْتَبَعُوا عَلَىٰ أَيَّ ضُرُّوكَ بِشَيْءٍ لَمْ يَضُرُّوكَ إِلَّا بِشَيْءٍ قَدْ كَتَبَهُ اللَّهُ لَكَ رُفِعَتِ الْأَقْلَاءِ وَجَفَتِ الصُّحُفِ Look how many things that the Prophet told him. If the whole, world come, the whole world comes together today to benefit you in a matter which Allah has not written for you, huh? and does not want this benefit to come to you, it will never come to you, and it will never happen for you. And also, if they all come together to harm you, but it has not been written for you in the eyes of Allah, and it's not gonna, then it will not take place. Because what matters is what Allah wa Taala wants. And then the Prophet said to him, Rufi'atil Aqlam, the pens have been lifted, wajaffatil suhuf, and the scripts have become dry. Just this hadith alone, just the statements of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, Al-Imam ibn al-Qayi Rajab al-Hambari rahimahullah, he wrote a whole book. Huh? He wrote a whole book, Mishkatu al-Masabih, I think, what do you call it, Mishkatu? Fi iqtibasi hadith wa siyyat al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, something like that. Where he just explained, after he explained it in his kitab, Jami' Ulum al-Hikam, Ibn Rajab went and explained it by itself separately. You see? So that is to show you that Ibn Abbas was a boy, young boy, very young. Remember Ibn Abbas when the Prophet died, he was only 13 or 14 or 15. So he was very young anyways. But the Prophet sallallahu educated him upon correct aqidah. Sufyan al-Thawri, he said this statement and also Abdullah ibn Mubarak said it as well. And also Abdullah ibn Mubarak said, which is what? Inna min sa'adati al-hadathi wal-a'jami an yuwafiqahum allahu the blessing for a young child and a person who is new to Islam. Those two. The young child who's growing up right now and the, the, the new Muslim. Both of them. The, the, the greatest thing for them is what? That Allah brings to them a scholar from Ahl Sunnah. That they, they, Allah blesses them 
by allowing them to take knowledge from a person of the Sunnah. Sufyan al Thawri said this, and Abdullah Mubarak said this. So look at it. The young kid, the first benefit that Sufyan al Thawri, or the, one of the greatest benefits for him, is to have a person of the Sunnah to take knowledge from. Because the worst thing for a child to grow up is to grow up upon innovation and to grow up upon misguidance. Abdullah ibn Shodab, he said, Inna min ni'matillahi ala shab. Abdullah ibn Shodab said, From the blessings of Allah upon a youngster, a youth, إِلَا تَلَسَّكَ أَيُّوَاخِيَ صَاحِبَ سُنَّةِ يَحْمِلُهُ عَلَيْهَا For a young youth, for the blessings of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, on him is that Allah brings to him a person of the sunnah who takes him to the sunnah and educates him upon the sunnah. Amr ibn Qais al-Mala'i, he said, إِذَا رَأَيْتَ الشَّابِ أَوَّلَ مَا يَنْشَأْ مَعَ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَعَةِ فَرْجُهُ Amr ibn Qais al-Mala'i said, if you see a youngster on his first stages, young kid growing, growing up, no, first stages, he, he, get, he falls under the hands of a person of the Sunnah, min ahli sunnati wal jama'ah, farju, hope for him, good. You see a young kid, he falls in the hand of a person of ahli sunnati wal jama'ah, then he said, hope, good for him. Wa idha ra'aytum ma ahli bid'ah, but if you see him as a young kid, in the hands of the people of innovation, then give up on him. Because the person is how he is at his first stages. Remember, if innovation corrupt, it, it creeps into you and it enters into you, even as a child, it takes hard effort and hard work for it to be taken out of you. So that's why it's important that the child at a very early stage, he's taught aqidah to sahihah. And of course, this goes hand in hand with the statement of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is, ma min mawludin illa wa huwa yuladu ala al-fitrah. There is no child who is born, except he's born upon the natural disposition, which is the aqeed al-sahiha. Fa'abawahu yuhawwidani aw yunassirani aw yumajjisani. His father, his mother, are the ones who play a role in either making him a Christian or a Jew. But the child is born upon what? Fitrah sahiha, a correct Natural disposition. The second, the second thing that the parents need to cultivate their children on and the tarbiyah of the children is, is Al-Quran was Sunnah. They teach the children the Quran and they teach them the Sunnah. وَلِذَلِكَ إِبْنُ خَلْدُونَ in his مقدمة, he says, اعلم نو أن تعليم الولدان للقرآن شعار من شعار الدين نو that teaching the children the Qur'an is a symbol from the symbols of the religion. This is a path taken by the scholars and the people of knowledge. And this is the path which they tread on. In all over the Muslim world and all over the world, the scholars, that's what they did. They first of all started to teach their children the Qur'an. Why? لِمَا يَسْبِقُ فِيهِ إِلَى الْقُلُوبِ مِنْ رُسُوقِ الْإِيمَانِ وَعَقَائِدِهِ مِنْ آيَاتِ الْقُرْآنِ وَبَعْضُ مُتُونِ الْأَحَادِيثِ The reason is because the Qur'an goes directly to the heart and it solidifies the correct iman and the aqeedah the child gets it from the Qur'an and then he says وَبَعْضُ مُتُونِ الْأَحَادِيثِ and then after that the child is then taught, Ibn Khaldun says, وَبَعْضُ مُتُونِ الْحَدِيثِ Some of the books of hadith, Arba'in al-Nawawi, Umdatul Ahkam, or Bulugul Maram, one of the two. You see, and then Al-Lu'lu al-Marjan, فِي مَتَّفَقَ عَلَيْهِ الشَّيْخَانِ And then he goes to uh, the hadith which Bukhari is only alone on, إِفْرَادَاتِ الْبُخَارِيَ عَلِ الْمُسْلِمِ And then it, the, it, the ones that Muslim are alone from Bukhari, and then he goes to other books like that. وَصَارَ الْقُرْآنُ وَصَارَ الْقُرْآنَ أَصْلُ التَّعْلِيمِ الَّذِي يُبْنَى عَلَيْهِ غَيْرُهُ مِنَ الْعُلُومِ And he goes, and the Qur'an becomes the foundation in all of the educations in which the child is acquiring for everything else is built upon the Qur'an. Abdullah ibn Abbas رضي الله تعالى عنه, he says, مَنْ قَرَأَ الْقُرْآنَ Anyone who memorizes the Qur'an and learns the Qur'an قبل أن يحتلب before he reaches age of puberty 
فَهُوَ مِمَّنْ أُوْتِيَ الْحُكْمَ صَبِيًّا He is a person who has been given wisdom at birth, at childhood. The third thing that the child should be taught is إتقان لغة العربية That the child is taught to solidify himself upon the Arabic language. He solidifies himself upon the Arabic language and he learns the Arabic language properly. Al-Imam Al-Mawardi in his book Nasihatul Muluk he says فَإِذَا بَلَغَ التَّأْدِيبَ وَالتَّعْلِيمَ فَالْوَجْهُ أَنْ يُبْدَأَ بِتَعْلِيمِ الْقُرْآنِ مَعَ لُغَةِ الْعَرَبِيَةِ If the child reaches an age of, you know, he understands things now and you're mannering him and he teaches that age where he can now start acquiring knowledge he goes فَالْوَجْهُ the correct way is أَنْ يُبْدَأَ بِتَعْلِيمِ الْقُرْآنِ You teach him the Qur'an مَعَ لُغَةِ الْعَرَبِيَةِ But whilst you're teaching him the Qur'an, you're also teaching him the Arabic language with it, he says. لِأَنَّهَا اللُّغَةِ الَّتِي أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ بِهَا كِتَابُ Because the Qur'an is the, sorry, the Arabic language is the language in which Allah has sent down the Qur'an in. وَخَاطَبَ بِهَا فِي شَرَائِعِ دِينِهِ وَفَرَائِضِ مِنْ لَتِي And it is the language which Allah addresses the legislation of his religion and the obligatory matters of this religion. وَبِهَا بَلَّغَ رَسُولُهُ صلى الله عليه وسلم سُنَنَهُ And it is this language in which the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم conveyed his message صلى الله عليه عليه So the language. And last but not least, what are effective ways? And this is the third point and I'm going to conclude with this. What are effective ways in which parents need to take in making sure they cultivate their children correctly? These five stages are what a, ch- a parent needs to do in order to cultivate their ch- your child correctly. And these are wasailu tarbiyatil mu'athira. They affect, they work properly. The first one is at tarbiyatu bil qudwa. You're a role model. You do it by action. The child looks up to you and he sees you doing it. The second is at tarbiyatu bil ibadah. You cultivate your children upon ibadah, excessive, you pray, you fast, you do extra ibadat. And you always remind your children when you're doing the ibadah that you're doing with two conditions that have to be there. So you tell, when I'm praying the salah, who am I praying it for? Allah. In what way am I praying? According to the Prophet wasallam. So you always remind the child this. Al-ikhlas wa mutaba'atil rasul. That I'm doing this action sincerely for Allah's sake. And I'm also doing it in accordance to the sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The third one is At-Tarbiyatu bil Maw'idah. The third one is you cultivate your child by giving him reminders. Just like Luqman said to his son, Ya Bunayya la tushrik billah, inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Oh my son, do not fall into uh, shirk uh, and oppress Allah Ta'ala by falling into shirk. So this was a moment that was a reminder from a father to his son. So you use those words such as father, daddy, abba, whatever language you speak. You use those words to get the heart of the child. It's mo'idah. It's not meant to scare him. It's not meant to be shouting at him. It's just to speak with tender and kindness. The fourth one is at-tarbiyatu bil mulahada. You observe your child. You are consistently looking at him and you're observing him. And this is muraqabatul awlad. You're observing your children. You're looking. And from this is the issue of gadgets and social media. Parents buy their children laptops. They buy, buy them ch- their children mobile phones and they don't follow their children up. So parents have to be engaged with their children and know what their children are up to. You don't just buy them a big a television and you put it in front of them or you buy them a, a laptop and you don't find out what they're doing with it. There was a mother who thought her daughter was doing her assignments every night. So she left her there and she said, oh, she's, my daughter never leaves her laptop. She's always reading. She's always... No, she's not. She's on social media. To the extent that nowadays for people to have to go outside to do haram, they don't need to. Everything is brought to the house. The child may not even move from that position. And he can do everything from the tip of his finger. 
So it's mulahada, it's very important. That if you, if you see your child used to read Quran, and then now he started to sing, you automatically have to know that. And say, oh, something has changed. What's happened? Every day you came into the house, you were reading Quran. When you walk under the staircase, you read Quran. I used to hear you. What happened? What has changed? But a child, a parent would only know that if he and the children were always spending time together. A parent who's always on the television. A father who's always away. A mother who just gets a screen and places it in front of the child and says, watch it. Will never know what's happening in that child's mind and what every progress that he's making daily. Five years later, she realized her child's insults. No, he's been doing this for five years. Where were you this five years? A, child, a parent comes up to you at the age of 18. The child's at 18 age, years of age. So the parent comes up to you and says to you, my 18-year-old child, I want you to advise them. What were you doing as a parent for 18 years? Of age, uh, 18 years? When this child got to this final conclusion, this, this, this position right now of what he wants to do, he doesn't want to listen to anybody, he's stubborn. Where were you as a parent? Where was the mulahada? Why, have you, why were you not observing anything? So the parent has to observe the child. Last but not least, al-uquba. There has to be punishment for children. There has to be what? Punishments. The same falls under the uquba, which is the opposite holds truth, which is that if he is good, he gets a prize for it. And that he is what? He's given, um, he's given a gift. He's given something to be happy about. The same way if he comes with something wrong, he's punished for it. And there are things that are consequences he has to bear. Things that he likes that he's going to lose. And things that will happen, happen to him. That is a summary of the concept, uh, um, the topic, Al-Tarbiyatul uh, Awlad. I hope I gave it justice, inshaAllah ta'ala. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi.